Hello, my name is Deep Saini. I'm President and Vice Chancellor of Dalhousie University, and this is The Deep Dive. Joining me today is my longtime colleague, Professor Peter Matheson. Professor Matheson is the Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh. You may know that back in the early 1800s, Dalhousie University was founded on the model of the University of Edinburgh. The key elements of this model and the striking similarities between our two institutions are the universities that are open to all and the universities with a strong commitment to international impact and engagement. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Matheson. Good morning, Peter. Uh, good morning from Halifax, of course. At uh, your end, it is good afternoon in Edinburgh. Such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much, Deep. It's a great pleasure to join you. You know, you and I have worked uh, in, on various things in the past, and it has, it has been a pleasure to get to know you. And today we're going to introduce our universities, or perhaps reintroduce our universities. Uh, as you are well aware, Dalhousie was founded about just over 200 years ago on uh, the principles established at, uh, at Edinburgh, uh, which, of course, um, is about double the size of uh, Dalhousie, uh, founded just over 400 years ago. And uh, one of the key principles that resonated with Dalhousie was that a university open to all. Of course, the open had a different meaning in those days, uh, and we won't go into that. And then I see the, the, the picture behind you, and I see the architectural similarity between the two universities. And I do know that uh, Dr. Andrew Brown in those days, and, uh, and the principal of uh, the university, Dr. George Husband Baird, were uh, copiously con uh, 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 consulted by Lord Dalhousie in establishing this university. And a number of early professors came from Edinburgh. Others actually ed were educated at Edinburgh. So there is a long standing and close connection between our universities. And that's what we are here to both celebrate and explore. So in that spirit, let me ask you the first question. As I, as I said, there is a history, shared history between the our two universities. And could you please tell us a little bit about um, the University of Edinburgh today and how it got there? Yeah, of course. Thank you very much, Deep. So thanks for that introduction. And uh, I must begin with a confession. I have never been to Nova Scotia, but I hope uh, one uh, aspect of our friendship will be that I'll put that right and I'll come and see you. Um, and I also want you to come here so that I can take you to Dalhousie Castle and take a photograph for you to, to, uh, to take back home. That's about 10 miles from where I'm sitting. Um, so um, the University of Edinburgh is, as you say, it's a, a university that's a bit different from the universities which preceded it. There was a time in history when uh, there were twice as many universities in Scotland as there were in England. So the, the oldest two are Oxford and Cambridge. And then the next four universities in the UK were all in Scotland. Uh, so they were St Andrews, Glasgow, Aberdeen and then Edinburgh. And those four universities are called the ancient universities in Scotland. And for uh, a couple of hundred years, there were twice as many universities in Scotland as there were in England, and Edinburgh was the youngest of those four. Um, now, the difference between Edinburgh and the other five universities at the, in the UK at that time is that we were the first university to be founded by the city, not by the church. And I think that's an important principle. It's a, it's a civic university. It's the original civic university. And it's a university founded by the city for the people of the city, founded by the tomb, as it's described here. Um, and that heritage is very important to us now. We still regard ourselves as a university for all. And in the last uh, two and a half years that I've been here, we've been determinedly trying to uh, restate our civic principles and our um, desire to be open to all and our desire to be relevant to the city and, and the country of Scotland, as well as to the wider world. And I know we might pick up on those themes uh, with some of the other questions. But uh, Peter, your use of the word civic university um, resonates with me very deeply. Um, th this is exactly where the, the houses focus is at this, this point. And as you said, Edinburgh, uh, it, it, it has a history of being a university anchored in its community, while it is a university that also uh, has a global eminence and global footprint. Um, Dalhousie is exactly on the same path. We, right from our inception, we have been deeply rooted in our community, serving the community, and, and we actually, I would say, 
Dalhousie is what it is because of the community, and this community is what it is because of Dalhousie. So there is that very close relationship. Um, tell me, what does what makes that relationship uh, a valuable relationship where, there, where you are a globally aspiring university, and yet you have that deep root in the university, and how the two interplay? Yeah, I don't see the two as in uh, in contention, although some people do. Some people feel that there is a tension between local or regional relevance and international relevance. I, I personally don't. I think that the same values, the same principles, the same mission can drive both local relevance and international relevance. Um, we Our student makeup is complicated here. So we have about 40,000 students, as you say, a big university, um, uh, and about a third of them are from Scotland. About another third are from uh, other parts of the UK or Europe, and then the other third are from outside Europe. So we have three sort of roughly equal sized student populations. And the, the third category, the international uh, students, come from all over the world. We've got very large numbers of students from North America and very large numbers from Asia, particularly China. Um, but we have students from all over the world and we have staff from all over the world. So it's a truly international organization. And I believe that that international uh, composition and our international mission brings relevance to the city. And so we are we, we're a source of inward investment because obviously our students and staff come here and they buy property and they will buy, buy goods. And so they can they contribute to the economy in that way. They also contribute to the extraordinary cosmopolitan city, which is which is Edinburgh. It's a capital city. It has great transport links. Um, it's smaller than Glasgow, but it is the capital of Scotland and it is a beautiful place. And, and the building that you see behind me is just one example of many beautiful historic buildings in a city that dates its history back hundreds of years. So um, it's a great city. It's surrounded by countryside. Just in the background behind the building, you can see one of the hills that surrounds uh, Edinburgh. Um, and there are some beautiful places to walk. There's the seaside quite close by. Uh, there's lovely countryside. So this is a small city. It's only half a million population. It's very walkable. And we know that one of the reasons why Edinburgh is a very popular university, and it's actually one of the most popular universities in the UK in terms of uh, burden of applications, um, and that's because of the city it's located in. It's, it's partly the history of the university itself, but it's also the city and the region. And in some ways, you can't separate those two. Uh, I think they've developed together over the last 437 years, and we cherish that very much as an important part of our identity. Yeah, you've just uh, listed perhaps three or four other things that are common between our university. When I look at the building behind you, I see the building I am sitting in at this point. If you had an exterior shot, it looked almost exactly like that. And that's called Henry Hicks Building. It's like your old college. Um, and the whole quad looks like this, actually, in many ways. So there are architectural similarities. Halifax is not quite half a million, but just under half a million. Similar things, small community, and so on. And this um, idea of attracting students from all over the world, we, we uh, about 60%, over 60% of our students come from outside Nova Scotia. So we are, uh, you know, uh, almost a unique university in, uh, in Canada, at least, where uh, far more students come from outside the province than within the province. Even the universities that are higher ranked than us attract uh, fewer students from out of the province than, than from within the province. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that, that is um, the, uh, an expression of the, the, the outward facing world, uh, you know, inclusive um, kind of ethos in, in our two universities where also we come together. And I wonder if our founding fathers already had that, that uh, vision for the universities and that's how we ended up where we are today. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the similarities are not accidental. I mean, including the architectural similarities, I think uh, Scotland is um, very proud of its educational heritage, very proud of the fact that we had more universities than England, very proud of the fact that a lot of that expertise was exported, particularly to, to North America. I mean, you'll be aware that the uh, alumni of the University of Edinburgh include two signatories of the American uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, they include the founder of what later on became Princeton University, and obviously they include the links into into Canada, particularly perhaps in, in Nova Scotia, which after all does mean New Scotland in, in Latin. And, and uh, you know, these, these links, this um, dissemination of educational experience and, and excellence uh, across the globe is something that I think Scotland has every reason to be proud of. Another fact that uh, that is probably not widely known, that Edinburgh attracts more Canadian students uh, than any other university in the UK. Yeah, we're very proud of that. That's right. Now let's come to something personal. You know, you and I have had 
some significant similarities in our in our academic paths as well as uh, you know our, our administrative paths and so on. You know, you come from a professional background in medicine. I come from a professional background in agriculture. Uh, we are both the first in our families to go to university, and then we had this uh, very pleasant distinction of being having been uh, presidents and vice chancellors in in two countries. On one outside, you know, you in Hong Kong me in Australia and then came back to lead the universities here that happened to be connected. Um, tell us how your international experiences, and they go beyond that you just serving in two countries as, as president, you know, you have done so many other things internationally. So those international experiences, how, how do those experiences inform what you do today and how has that um, that influenced your outlook on higher education and research and, and, and un university administration? I, um, I probably hadn't analyzed all of that very much until the last few years. And, and, and it, the, the, the thinking, I think, which has driven me um, is, is very much based on two things. Firstly, the fact that um, I was the first in my family to go to university. And um, uh, I consider that everything good that's happened in my life has been a result of, of education and as a result of me getting that opportunity um, and I can even say that if my wife's in the room because we met in the first term at university. So um, everything good has come from that. Um, and I believe that I'm really uh, strongly driven by a mission that I want to see everybody else have those opportunities. Because for me, it was transformational. Education can be transformational. It's the, it's the strongest tool of social mobility. And I believe that um, potential is equally distributed across the human race, but, but clearly opportunity is not. And so um, the task of people like you and me is to, is to cre create those opportunities and make sure that they're equitably available to everybody. The other thing which I think has driven me, and again, I hadn't really thought about this so much until recent years, is what I would describe as getting outside your comfort zone. I think um, there is a tendency uh, to, to stick within your comfort zone. That's what human beings like to do. And I consider that the, the most developmental things that have happened to me have been when I've got outside that comfort zone. And there are two very good examples. One is uh, the, the, the move to Hong Kong that you referred to. That was uh, a surprise to me and to a number of people that knew me. And no, nothing really uh, heralded that. It just, it just sort of happened. Um, and, and it was a wonderful experience. Hong Kong's a great place to live and work. It's, it's a fabulously exciting uh, educational scene there with very high quality universities and, and of course the one that I led was in my opinion the highest quality but I would say that wouldn't I um, but it is the oldest and it's the English speaking university uh, the only comprehensive English speaking university in, in Greater China so um, it was unusual for a Brit to be appointed to such a post uh, and it was definitely outside my comfort zone and I think I learned a lot whilst I was there the other example is the is the medical teaching and research that I've done in uh, in Africa particularly in Uganda um, I started going to Uganda in the late 90s uh, and I went back many times to do teaching and research there in a, in a rural part of the country and that led to other teaching opportunities elsewhere, particularly in East Africa and a little bit in West Africa and South Africa. So I've had a lot of experience there and again I would describe that as getting myself outside my comfort zone, a real different set of circumstances, a real different set of priorities and I consider I learned so much from those experiences. So those two things I think I bring to my university leadership. I want opportunities for all, and I want opportunities for people to get outside their comfort zone, including international uh, travel, international experiences, clearly made more difficult in the current circumstances, but I think we can provide some of those international experiences electronically, exactly in the same way that you and I are now talking across thousands of miles and across different time zones. Um, uh, we can do that for our students as well. And, and some principle of international mobility even in times of restricted travel, uh, will be very important to me uh, in, in, in my time here in Edinburgh. It does. I mean, it, it is so central to forming a global citizen that's central to the globalized world that we live in today. So it's so critical. You know, very well put. Um, you know, while, while we are on that uh, global education subject, uh, and you, you know that I have strong ambitions to, um, to, to further internationalize uh, Dalhousie, from your experiences, which are so rich, could you tell us how um, the global activity is central to the pursuit of excellence for a university? Yeah, I think it's because, well, I think it's, it's partly because I think so much of the benefit of a university experience is defined by what happens outside the classroom. So um, clearly we put a lot of effort into what happens inside the classroom and, and we're adapting that in the current circumstances to be a mixture of digital experience and face-to-face -face experience. 
but all the other experiences that university life can bring, including meeting people from all over the world, you know, what we call internationalization at home. So by, by being a student at your university or mine, you get to meet people from all over the world, people from different backgrounds, people from different um, uh, environments and with different experiences. That's hugely uh, enriching. And then uh, some, of the, some of it can be done by travel or work or study in other parts of the world. So um, I do think that, that that university experience outside the classroom is, is really important. And I suppose the other thing I would say is that certainly until the last uh, uh, few months, I've tended always to think about the, the world as, as, as one place. And, and, and my students will be graduating into a very global environment where they could go and work anywhere in the world now. That is being reset, obviously, in current circumstances, but I think it will still remain true. So we need to equip people not just to function in one jurisdiction or one language or one environment, but to be able to be adaptable and go and work in other parts of the world and spread the, spread the benefits of the education that they've received to other communities that maybe have not been so fortunate. So um, I think those twin reasons are, are why I believe that, that international linkages are, are so important to the mission of, of places like Dalhousie and Edinburgh. And Edinburgh is, of course, a living embodiment of that. I, I understand you guys teach in, what, something like 30 different languages? Yeah, we've got good language programs, yeah. Yeah, that's quite remarkable. Well, listen, I'm, we're coming to, to the end of our uh, this time together. We, there'll be others, but let me let me finish by um, we finish with where we started. You know, a university open to all, and of course, uh, you know, in in twenty sorry in eighteen eighteen when Dalhousie was established, open to all had a different meaning than it, it does today. But again, we as universities we remain committed, yours and mine to that ethos of a university open to all. And we have, we've been expanding that openness. And that brings me to, to our focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we, there, is, there is often debate about the, the pursuit of EDI and pursuit of excellence. Some people put them together, others uh, would, would, would try to detract us from, from that combination. And, I just want to hear from you and your experiences as to how um, EDI and excellence are actually linked in your mind. I think it comes back to the point about potential. So um, the University of Edinburgh has actually been pretty good at um, uh, widening participation, which is what we call the attempt to um, make sure that ed education is available to all, irrespective of socioeconomic background. Um, and um, we have, for a number of years, had what we call contextual offers, whereby students from less advantaged backgrounds uh, have different sets of expectations of their of their exam achievements in order to get a place, um, all above what we would regard as the, the sort of minimum standard to succeed. But nevertheless, they're contextual according to the context in which the exams were taken. And in the time that I've been here, I think we've stepped that up even further. We've made really good progress on some of our targets in terms of making sure that admissions are inclusive. I would say that we're better at it in Scotland than we are outside Scotland. So um, the, a lot of the principles are brought to um, disadvantaged populations in Scotland and the, and the proportion of students that we recruit from those areas has gone up significantly. Um, we're not as good at it for our international students or indeed for our students from the rest of the UK where um, the, 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 the context is different. And so I think we need to extend some of the principles that we brought to our Scottish admissions to other students. For example, a lot of our international students by definition are wealthy because the fees are high and unless they get a scholarship, they can't come uh, easily to the UK. So I'd like to do something about that. And we've got one or two pioneering schemes, one in Hong Kong actually, and one in, in America funded by philanthropy to try and bring those same principles to bear to allow kids from less advantaged backgrounds to be able to, to get here. Soon after I got here, I was accused of lowering standards and and there was a there was a newspaper article that suggested that I was lowering the standards of the University of Edinburgh, and I absolutely refute that. It's not a question of lowering the standards; it's a question of leveling the playing field, and that's what I've been trying to do, and that's what I will continue to try to do. The other accusation is that by having these policies and by bringing in students from less advantaged backgrounds, you're somehow denying a place to other well qualified students. And my answer to that is yes, that's true as long as total numbers are constrained. If total numbers are constrained, then inevitably, if you make places available to one group of applicants, you're denying places to somebody else. 
I personally think that's an acceptable price to pay for the for the first, which is the leveling of the playing field. If numbers were not constrained, then you know we'd be able to take more students from all backgrounds. But uh, obviously, there are limits on uh, in publicly funded universities like ours. There are limits on the numbers that can be accommodated. Yeah, and and of course the same principle applied applies to the recruitment of faculty and staff as well. You know, uh, top talent is hard to find, and uh, I, I I believe that if you limit yourself to one or two communities from which you are hiring, or 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 don't hire broadly from every community where the talent is, then you're also depriving yourself from uh, from the full pool of talent that's available out there. So it's just, you know, it, actually EDI works for, for an institution in multiple ways, and it's not just simply the right thing to do. It, it is actually an operational necessity and gives you a competitive advantage. I might just cite one other example, Deep, which is, which is sort of interesting in the time that I've been here. So um, uh, soon after I arrived, I was told that it would be the 150th anniversary of a group of women called the Edinburgh Seven. Now, I don't know how much publicity this has had uh, across the world, but the Edinburgh Seven were a group of women that were um, recruited to study medicine in Edinburgh. They, Edinburgh was the first university to admit women to study medicine, um, but they were never allowed to graduate. They, were, they, they didn't graduate because uh, there was a backlash uh, from the community and from the profession and the, and the university eventually agreed that these women should not graduate. So they completed their course, they passed their exams, but they never graduated. And it was the 150th anniversary of that. And so what we decided to do, actually in my first year here, was to award posthumous degrees to those seven women. And we had a degree ceremony whereby each of the seven women was represented by one of our current medical students, again, a woman, and, uh, a, and a degree was awarded uh, posthumously to that person. And I felt that was putting right a historical wrong. And so um, there is evidence that although we talked about university for all uh, in the early years, that was mostly men. Um, and so uh, we, we're now starting to seek to put that kind of thing right. And I'd still say we've got a long way to go on equality, diversity and inclusivity, um, you know, not just in the UK, but I think across the world. And so progress has definitely been made. And I think the principles are very strong, uh, but, but we still have work to do to really uh, fully implement them. Yeah, I think those things are... Uh are a good thing to remember and a probably a good moment to end this conversation on that uh, we, we, we said things way in the past, which applied in a very narrow way. Uh, the definition has been broadening over time. We've made progress, but we have a long way to go and, and we will continue to march forward. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to uh, the Dalhousie community and my very best wishes to them all. And you deep must come and see us in Edinburgh. Thank you, Peter. And I can assure you that one of the first universities on my list to visit is Edinburgh once we get out of this, uh, the curse of COVID-19. Yeah, look forward to that. Okay, so hope to see you. And, and of course, before that, we will see each other in the meeting that's coming up. We both serve on the, on the board of the Council for Advancement and Support of Education, which is the world's largest organization supporting university philanthropy and, and advancement. And we both have the fortune of working, uh, serving on the board of that. So uh, I look forward to seeing you on Thursday, I believe. Yes, I'll see you again soon, Deep. And until then, all the very best. Thank you and all the best to you as well. Bye-bye now.